Thank you, Chenda. And hello, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we are concluding our Q&A panel with several instructors, faculty, current or past board members with the NACBA. Um, we started this series a week ago, a week and a half ago, um, to address technical issues relating to business valuation and financial litigation, have fielded your questions through an online survey and also through the Q&A chat box, as Chinda just mentioned. If, we, uh, if you have a question you'd like addressed during this discussion, um, please use the chat box and include as much detail as you can, and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. We're joined again by our panel. Um, that includes Mark Cusick, Laurie Maston, Hubert Klein, Michael Kaplan, Zach Myers, and Greg Regan. Thanks everyone for joining us on this Sayonara uh, webinar series before we launch into a whole other uh, series of trainings, which we'll post to the NACVA.com forward slash COVID hyphen 19 page, which will begin um, offering mentoring, coaching, and more um, content specific or, or engagement and industry specific type training. So hello everybody, how y'all doing? Hey Brian. Brian. Hello Brian, how are you? I'm doing pretty good, hanging in. So the topic for today, we're gonna to get into uh, industry sectors, specialty purposes for business valuation, um, in fact, Tinda, if you want to uh, forward to that slide in our PowerPoint deck, um, let's just get right to it since we have two hours um, and quite a bit to cover um, relating to sources of data and industry um, um, content. Uh, talk about um, each of you why this is a critical component of valuation also with litigation. Um, and let's dive into some of the areas and places where we can find uh, data. So Brian, I'll just jump in real quick. Uh, seems to be the place that I get to start all the time is at the beginning. Um, so Ibis World, it's, it's listed there at the top. And one of the things that um, as a group we were talking about yesterday, planning for today, is it, you know, when we're thinking about the different industries that are impacted, we kind of need to just know who's posting um, information live, real time, who's keeping up to date, you know, as far as service providers. And Ibis World kind of rose to the top of the list. And I, I don't want to say that we have a hierarchy of any particular source over another. Definitely not the issue. Um, but one thing that is super attractive about um, hitting the Ibis World uh, website on a regular basis is that they are, they have this uh, complete section. So I don't know if you can switch to your laptop, actually, yeah. Brian. Yeah, I'll, and I'll do that, Chanda. I'll share my screen. Pull that up. Because when you land on the Ibis World website, at the top, there's this banner that goes across the top for uh, COVID-19. And when you click down into that um, COVID-19 link, there's several pieces of information that I, I think we just want to make sure everybody's aware of. I'll give you a second to get that going. There we go. Yeah. So if you click on that learn more, perfect. Then we have this industry exposure intensity by country, but you can see that they've got that exposure tool listed there. Uh, there you go, perfect. And you can, you can click through that link and it's really interesting. You can look at all sectors. You can hover over that map and see percentage wise, uh, what the U.S. is versus another country as far as exposure risk currently. And then if you were to actually click on one of the sectors over there on the left-hand side, or you could even just say all, whichever one you want to do, you have the ability to sort by country. Uh, once you kind of go down onto that, to the list, there you go. So you see Australia is up front. So you can reverse the sorting by country and get you the United States will pop up as the top area. And then they're ranked um, high, medium, and low. But within each one of those industry areas, you can, you can read a little bit more about what's going on, what the upstream and downstream impact might be. And so that's, that's a fairly um, 
useful tool. You don't have to have an, a, a, a subscription to Ibis World to actually get in there. And there's a lot of detail that you can get without having that subscription. Now, another thing that's super interesting about what Ibis World is doing, if you go back to that landing page for COVID-19, before the sectors, yeah. And you can scroll down. The other thing that you can see is that there is, um, well, let's see, maybe that's not exactly where it is, Brian. So there's a landing page. If you just go back, click the Ibis World um, icon, there you go. And scroll down below there. So what I'm looking for is, is Ibis World, their chief economist, Rick Buzinski, is doing some little podcasts and they're snippets. They're about 11 to 15 minutes each. And what he's doing on those podcasts is providing information uh, kind of as, as best he can real time. So he has a couple of episodes out there. He's got some really good insights and you can click on there and just listen to them. Like I said, they're, they're fairly short. Um, his episode two that he just published a couple of days ago, it uh, focuses in on segments, industry sectors, and risk tied to like the education section, uh, entertainment, recreation, um, other types of services like hair and nail salons. So he's actually going through in his podcast, giving us some of that information. What I'll be really interested in hearing is what his podcast for today or tomorrow is, because what's in the news right now is um, information relating to our GDP. I'm sure most of you kind of caught on to that this morning, that our economy is shrinking for the first time in the U.S. For in the first time in six years, and it's the um, worst contraction that we've had since 2008. The GDP fell in the first quarter this year by 4.8%. And just as a reminder, four, fourth quarter 2019, it was up 2.1%. We fell 4.8% first quarter 2020, which we all kind of expected that that would happen. But the actual, you know, on the street expectation was that the U.S. would fall maybe three and a half to four percent, and they fell almost five percent. Mm -hmm. So when when we start thinking about what that first quarter drop means, thinking back to March 31st, I mean, we were all just pretty much beginning our first couple of weeks in social distancing and kind of cessation of some types of businesses. So I think that's important. Anyway, I wanted to point that out on Ibis World uh, because that's that's something that if you're not kind of, you know, tinkering around on their website, you might not come across it, but it would be great to keep up because he's giving those on a regular basis. And, and Laurie, I think it's important to point out that that's, that's not a paid for service, that part of it. That's free. That's before you even log on. So you can go to their site and access that information and not have to be a subscriber. Exactly. Exactly. And, and if you are a subscriber, they're working really hard to update as many of the industry sectors as they can for the effects of COVID-19. Yeah, it seems like they've got a section here for trending topics. Yes, yeah, so they're trying as best they can to get those industries updated quickly because in you know their normal course of business, they're not updating them, you know, all at the same time. They all kind of have staggered starts, but they certainly recognize that you know, the valuation profession is looking for new and updated information, at least first quarter 2020. So they're, throw, they're, they're doing them as quickly as they can. There have been a few email communications where I've seen where they're updating. We've just updated and reposted, you know, 13 new industries. So you might, if you are a subscriber, just pay attention to your email. It's a little bit more difficult if you're not a subscriber to land on their page and determine exactly, you know, what the most recent ones that have been updated, but they are absolutely making a, a pretty good effort to number one, cover the COVID content to give us some stuff from an economic standpoint, like Hubert pointed out gratis, <laughs> you don't have to pay for it. And then they are focused on getting those industry um, areas updated. So, and if you do have an industry area that you're looking for and you don't have the update, you can contact them and say, hey, this is one we're looking for. And they'll give you an estimated production date or release date for that update. Great. All right. 
what's the next site you'd like to take a look at? Well, another one is first research that we use quite a bit. And we all agree, you know, there's, there's a, no one source that is the only place that we go to because they all have different attributes. So first research, I really like, it's got some um, attributes to it that, you know, just from a valuation standpoint, I'm, I'm constantly looking for. First research is, um, you know, owned by Dun and Bradstreet. So as far as the size of the entities, Ibis World and, and first research that, you know, ownership entities, they're pretty big. But what I've noticed about first research is they are not um, publishing or keeping track with putting COVID information out there on their splash pages. So it, I don't find information directly by just going in and looking like I do from IPIS World, but they are updating their uh, industry profiles. Uh, again, it's, it's a little bit different, difficult to go in and just see what's the list but the nice thing that, um, and I guess this is kind of turning into a resources conversation to begin with, sorry. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing about uh, first research is you'll see that tab behind that says state. Do you see that tab on your landing page, state and provinces? So in, in addition to just the industry data, you can go in and find information on states. Now, Ibis World does focus some of their reports on states within industry sectors as well. So I don't want the impression to be that first research is the only one that has by state, but the first research data by state is more economic, you know, focused rather than industry focused. And I, I think the important part here is it's really not a resource chat. We're, we're, I think we're creating awareness for a lot of people that we've talked about in the prior three webinars, you know, that your professional judgment and your sufficient relevant data that you're going to rely on in your opinions, well, this is where you get a lot of that information. And even the whole thing with the economy and, and the 4.5 negative, well, most economists say that happened in the last two weeks of March. Up until that point in time, the economy was going along pretty good. So all these analysts and economists who are now updating these reports, they have a lot to digest. So while it may not be in some of these resources, in the coming weeks, they're going to disseminate a lot of the information as soon as they unravel exactly what happened and, and hopefully put some rhyme to reason as to where they think we're going on the other side of this. Um, the big thing is, is it looks like a lot of states are starting to ease up or free up some things that people can do. And these economists are going to have to weigh all that and what the impact may be. So first research, IBIS, and many of the other ones that we have out there they're going to be changing. So now is the time to be plugged in and looking at that information. Right. And, and you bring up a great point, Hubert. You know, we can't, you know, can't lose sight of what our standards say and our standards part of, you know, our analysis needs to be based on sufficient relevant data. And we typically kind of think of not having sufficient relevant data related to the business or the business owner, you know, they're not giving us the information or they don't have the records. And here I, I want us to pay attention to it's it that really that goes to everything. So the economic analysis, the industry analysis. And I think overall, when we are looking at all these different resources, I think, you know, not that we get lax a little bit um, in our industry analysis section of our valuation work. But I, I think we're going to have to be hyper focused on the periods leading up to our valuation date, what those historical industry research providers have pre and post the valuation date and, and looking at when COVID is going to be impacting the business in between there. So I think to, to rise to the level of sufficient relevant data, we're going to have to do a little bit more work on getting information from more than one resource. Mm -hmm. You know, Larry, I think it's also important for everybody to understand that these, even these reports as updated, they're trying to do their best to get it out to everybody as soon as they can, but it still might be premature. Mm -hmm. And you're still not going to get that forecasting capability or understand what's really going on, even through the second quarter, until you get some, some good data that's coming in here. Um, like you said, we just got that information at 4.5% or so this morning. Um, there's no way they can update that information into this report or what they project right. this to be going forward. So, you know, not only do you have to understand where you're at from a regional standpoint, but from an industry standpoint, but also from an entity standpoint, each entity is going to be independent of everybody else. And you're going to have to just use all the tools that we've always used to be able to analyze this information and then use this information like we always have to be able to get it 
as close as you can, but then if this doesn't get you there, you got to still do additional research. Yeah, I would suspect that we're going to see a lot more of those industry reports being updated. I, I you know, since yesterday, I think one of the one of the um, elements that they've been waiting on is to have that those first quarter results kind of posted. So I think that's going to drive a lot. So I, I guess a caution would be when you are pulling industry reports, pay close attention to when it was published. You know, you want the reports as of your evaluation date, but pay real close attention to that publication date. Was that before or after the announcement of what's going on with the GDP? I think that's going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. I also think it's important to have information as of, of 331, but they're also going to be what their forward-looking thinking is in a lot of stuff as well, which is going to be important. One thing also, when we talked about the way you can sort the IBIS world and many of the other databases, uh, it was short Australia and we needed to get to the United States. Well, if you have a client who has a lot of their product coming from overseas or their raw materials, you can go print the report for China or the Far East or somewhere else. So it's not just looking at the report specific to your client who's based in the States, but also you can go investigate their supply chain connections wherever they're getting their goods from. Yeah, I was about to add good indicator is going back to that app that or the, the map that Ibis World has. So, you know, the, the bigger map looking at the high risk versus low, and it's they're keeping that up real time too so you can you can see where your upstream and downstream countries come from and then go back and look at that risk tied to it as well excellent You're i think it's good for everyone to realize that we're not only ne needing to look at the industry that the subject company is in that we're evaluating but we're going to need to look at the industries and the markets that the, our company suppliers are in and that the customers are in this code that is so spread out across the world and across the u.s a lot of different things are happening in different markets and industries are being impacted, impacted in different ways. And I think it's going to be important to expand our industry research, um, at least in the near term. Right. Pay attention to make sure that you know how the data is. If you're using data from any source or multiple sources, pay attention to how it's collected and know that because a lot of the times so you can't explain how the data is extracted you can't even dream of trying to apply it. So you have to understand how the data is extracted, where it comes from, and try to understand that process. And the sampling process, and, and that, that applies to everything, whether it's government data, it's industry data here, or, or whatever you use, because ultimately, you know, this is stuff that you're gonna be trying to use to form the basis of your opinion in, in a litigation situation, uh, at least. And so just understand very, very, uh, detailed about how that information is collected, what's included in it, what's not. That way you can use it to the best of your ability. Yeah, it's a very good it's thing awesome. because most organizations publish that in the beginning of whatever they're, they're publishing. And maybe not their actual proprietary algorithm of how they do it, but at least what they're looking at because the worst question ever be asked on the stand is, well, you're using this information from such and such a source. Do you know how they compiled it? Um, no. Well, you mean you didn't read the first three pages where they told you how they did their study, but you relied on all their information. So, you know, it's a catch 22. So that's something that's really, really good to point out that people, you know, in addition to understanding the data, understand how the data got there. You don't have to do the calculations or say where it came from, but at least have a general understanding of what type of survey they put together. Well, and, and honestly, that's part of our standards, too, because we there's another part of our standards that, you know, is very applicable, but we think of it in a different way, and that's reliance on third parties. We typically think of reliance on third-party information and what level of responsibility we're taking on that uh, tied to an equipment appraisal or a real estate appraisal or something like that. Well, these industry and economic resources are no different, and so, you know, they fall under that uh, shield of our standards of we have to state, you know, who we're relying on and why and know something about that underlying basis, right? So Hubert, you and Zach are just right, spot on. We need to, if it's a survey, we need to understand, it, you know, was it a scientific survey? How is it prepared? Where is, where do they get their information? What are their inputs, et cetera? I mean, it's the same thing we do in a cost of capital, right? If we're relying on the, on the, the Duff and Phelps information or the old Ibbotson's, we kind of had to explain how it was compiled and where it came from. We should still do that with any data source that we use, even if we're talking about evaluation and using it market multiples, you know, where they came from, how they got there and where they're from. A, a great way of looking at it, um, and I'm quoting um, Frank Rosio, the minute you put something in your report, the minute you make reference to a research source, 
a data source, the minute you incorporate it into your work product, you own it. And if you own it, you better be prepared to explain it. And if you can't explain it, it could prove embarrassing. Mm-hmm. One of the other things, guys, you're going to have to watch. I mean, Larry was spot on with the, the publication date. I think that it's important. If you start using multiple sources and one date is even 30 days older than the other, they to each other based on the additional information. So make sure just because you have multiple sources, if you have two different points in time, I believe that this information for the next you know, quarter or two, it's going to move pretty quickly. And yeah. you're going to be able to, at, at some point, have to take a look at the latest information you have first and I think put a little bit more weight into to what's going on. Well, here, here's, a, here's one spot on and it deals with, um, this one was with uh, Integra's information, okay? And what happened was, is I was doing a damages case for a hardware store that basically had a burglary and was burnt down and we were trying to do the calculation of gross profit and figure out the inventory value and all that. And we had an Integra to Nibris World report and the ratios are pretty close. Now this was early 08 before everything hit the fan. Well, by the time the report came uh, due and everything, we couldn't find the original information. So somebody said, oh, let's go reprint the information. Well, they reprinted the information and, and, and an update had come out on both data sources. And wouldn't, you know, the gross profit percentage had changed and it wasn't an immaterial change, but it had changed by about two and a half points. And we finally found the original ones that we printed. You know, we called the publisher and said, what happened? And they basically said, well, there's a drastic change in the economy that impacted our historical numbers that we're reporting. And, and it kind of took this thing down. So that's why it's important to know the date and be careful if you're running multiple reports with different dates, because some of the data or ratios can change and often do. Well, and I, I think um, more focus is going to be on, you know, let's just say we have three resources. Let's say I pull Ibis World, I pull First Research, and, you know, I'm looking at the write-up of the industry. And let's say I, you know, call up key value data and um, I have them do a custom report, right? And so the information in each one of those right now, if I was doing a March 31st valuation, I'm going to guess, <laughs> hard guess, that there's going to be a pretty big variance in between the outlook that they're estimating. And so I, I think we're going to have to spend a little bit more time on describing the found, you know, we're thinking about um, the, the quality of the data, quantitative and qualitative data. We're going to have to put a lot more into our reports about describing why we're relying on one versus another or how we're averaging or coming up with some kind of um, central tendency, you know, when you have a, a wide, you know, breadth of expectation moving forward. And the most important part of our industry analysis is to tie it to the entity that we're valuing. And so, as, as Laurie is indicating, you can have different sources of information and you need to rely upon the information that you can correlate most closely to the business that you're valuing. Which is going to be difficult because, uh, you know, industries are going to be impacted differently and where the business is located, I mean, there's going to be, there should be in all of our analyses, a lot more emphasis on the location and the regional economy, you know, state rules, how, how long your business can be open, you know, how, what percentage can be there. A quick example, today in here in Colorado, one of the news stories, um, I was listening to an interview of the uh, president of the Colorado Restaurant Association. And she said that they took a poll, you know, an, an informal poll, but took a poll of their membership and said, you know, at, if you, you know, what would happen if you have to wait until the middle of May to open your restaurant versus the end of May? And the poll showed that if the restaurants have to wait till the middle of May here in Colorado to open, that 12% of them just said, well, we'll just never open if we have to wait that long. If you extend that to May 31st, so just two weeks, that goes from 12% to 22%. Right. And I would you know, wage that that is a different percentage result and expectation here in Colorado as compared to you know, San Francisco versus LA. So not just a state to take state issue, but a city to city issue. Right. Well, there's another yeah, issue. entity Tom issue. Tom that is, you know, I was hearing today that the pay, payroll protection program, right? Everybody's talking about how great it is and, and people are going to be able, they said it estimates 63 million jobs will be saved for the next month because of that. 
Then there's another follow-up article that basically says, um, who knows what's going to happen to the labor market, that unemployment might remain high because, believe it or not, the, the unintended consequences of a good deed is that many more people, especially in those types of jobs, are making more money on unemployment than they would be if they went back to their first job. And well, how is that going to impact the movement back to the labor market? Right. Yeah. It's also a challenge with the PPP. If you receive the PPP and you have to keep the number of employees for that to be a grant going forward, and you can't bring those people back and your numbers change because they'd rather be on unemployment instead of back to the workforce, you might have an issue on the grant. And I think they're working on that as we speak. But one of the other things I'd like to make sure that everybody understands is even though you're looking at the industry, the industry reacts differently based on region and based on and the independent entity. So we don't want to think that just because you're looking at an industry or they're giving you insight on an industry that it, it works the same way for every entity because it doesn't. It, it, it'll give you some guidance, but it's only going to help you be specific to that particular company, but you got to bring it home then. You got to tell the story and how that's going to impact you, where the different places are around the world that are impacted with that industry and how your supply chains are, just like everybody's been talking about. You got to bring it home to the bottom line and see how it affects that company's cash flows. I believe it's paying. We have an observation here um, that there may be a convergence of certain data results, which may help establish position um, to the extent for the valuation. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Well, that's interesting. We were talking about this yesterday. So it's a, um, whoever made that comment, that it's a good comment because one thing that I've noticed um, in the recent years between um, Ibis World and First Research, as an example, is that they're getting uh, First Research is getting some of its data from Ibis World directly and from BB Resources directly. Now, BB Resources is not publishing industry reports, but they do have the market transactions. So that's kind of floating into the First Research data that we get. And then some of the information that Dun & Bradstreet has kind of floats into the Ibis World reports as well. So I think it's a really good observation. Absolutely. But, you know, to the extent that we see a good convergence of that data, then that's a stronger position that we can take, right? But in, in the short term, that may not happen, right? So that's why everybody's got to be – the convergence isn't going to happen immediately because of a natural time lag and when people put information together. So if there are those differences, you need to understand them and what's driving them. But you figure in a month or so, everybody's going to have all this worked out and they should all be close to the same page. I mean, it's kind of like evaluation, right? Theoretically – or a damages report. If we do it right and the other expert does it right too, we should be close. And if we're far apart, we figure out where it went wrong and who went wrong. The same thing with data convergence. If they're close and you get a comfort level, but if there's a wide disparity, you know, it's your job to try to reconcile that and understand that. And believe it or not, many, many times there's a logical explanation for those, those data differences. You know, it's also important to remember that every one of these is trying their best to give you the most current data possible but it doesn't mean that, that they have the, the crystal ball either, right? They're all trying to do what they can with the information that they have, but remember how it all fits together and ultimately that they may get it close, but then they're gonna have to put something together in a month that maybe changes their mind based on the information they get a month from now. So it's so new, it's so raw that, that not everybody, they're still trying to report it. And they're also trying to forecast it and try to understand where it's all going but they don't have all the information to really necessarily make final conclusions. This is a great even the reporting of historical data, whether it be like CPI, even, sometimes can be flawed at first. So I, I usually wait a little bit after uh, information is published just to make sure there's no revisions. And I think there would be uh, plenty of opportunity to make some mistakes in uh, the current point in time that we're in. So just keep that in mind as well. I, I think that's going to become real relevant as to not just your valuation date, but your report date. So it's, Hubert, it kind of goes back to the issue that you had, you know, the date that your report was issued. So if there's some updated or revised estimates that are published after your actual report date, then it, if you're in litigation, it might bring up the question, do I have an obligation to update or revise my opinions because new information became available relative to that period of time that was uh, important to my valuation date, but after the time that I issued my opinions or my report. 
Mm-hmm. And you, it, it's important that you disclose that, that should additional information come to my attention, should there be new updated information that affects my opinion, that affects the outlook, I reserve the right to update my analysis and update my opinions. And especially in the context of litigation, where we're, we're using ex post so much more than we do in a, in a typical valuation setting. Well, here, here, here's an example. And, and, and we know, let, let me just add this one thing and, and then I'll give it to you. And at times like this, when we know that things are so different, the world is so different, the information's so different, and the sources from which we get the information are updating, and we expect them to, you know, to change their outlooks, to change the, the inputs that we would use, we, we have to be aware of that and be prepared to use those updates and put our readers on notice. Right, exactly. And here's, here's an old uh, Abbott and Costello joke, and I'm showing my age, but uh, I'll go through it. Um, somebody appro- approaches Luke Costello and says, listen, I'm going to sell you the, the program to the racetrack. I can sell you today's program for a dollar or yesterday's program with all the winners for $5. <laughs> kind of like data, you know, it's going to change. If we have a report today and it says one thing and it's drastically different two months from now or a month from now, because something, we don't know what's going to happen, but something could drastically change. They could come up with a vaccine overnight or whatever and boom, and everybody's off to the races. We just have to be prepared for that. And and Michael's right that if we know something and we hear it and it contradicts what we've already seen, we have an obligation to one, review it and consider it. And if it's in material, we need to actually communicate it to our client and counsel. Uh, sure. Hubert, envision yourself sitting on the witness stand, giving testimony about an opinion that you formulated a month ago. And you know that there are subsequent events, that, that there are updates to the, to the information, and you're giving your opinion based upon what you had in your report. You better be prepared to be oh, bombarded by opposing counsel. And you don't want to put yourself in an embarrassing situation, correct? No, my client will know, my attorney will know what my answer will be if I'm asked that question and they don't ask me it. So that actually brings up Michael and Hubert. I know this is the opportunity for the audience to ask us questions, but I want to throw one question back at you guys. Is if we do have an industry, let's just say that this is an industry research issue, okay? and the industry information is updated after you've issued your reports, let's go back, it's material, gross profit percentage changes, it's a damages calculation, it's super relevant, right? Mm -hmm. Now, would you consider that um, a subsequent event issue that subsequent to you issuing your report, the event is not COVID, the event is we have new information relevant. Would you consider it new data, subsequent event issues? How would you classify that? Because Attorneys are always saying, we don't want you to change your opinions. We don't have time. That's not allowed. We've passed the deadlines. You know, you know how they work, right? So how would you get that point across to them that you need to update it? It's a conversation with the attorney that I understand that you're the advocate for your client. However, I'm the advocate for my opinion and my report, and I'm here to assist a trier of fact, counsel, and my client. And We're accountants. We're problem solvers, right? We like to be the person to help people solve the problem. Well, it's a disservice if there's been a change in the problem that the client might not be happy with not to communicate that to them because that's our job. You know, sometimes people who work in the tax world today, guess what? Sometimes you tell people they owe $50,000 in tax, even though they did all the best tax planning because they didn't tell you they sold Amazon in December before the crash. So, you know, sometimes giving bad news or, or news that people don't like is part of the job. And good attorneys appreciate that too, because if you can forewarn an attorney uh, bad news, well, maybe, maybe they can settle it before the trial date or what have you. you well, know, our credibility I mean, is so critical in litigation that we absolutely have to protect our credibility by sharing information that we learn that impacts information that we relied upon that needs to be updated. And that information is going to get out there. We might, as be, we might as well be the ones that put it out there. That's going to support our credibility rather than present the numbers, present the analysis as it was a month ago when we did it and when we completed our report and dated our report and then let the guy on the other side put it out there. 
I mean, well, I, that's I think dangerous. There's, there's no doubt that anybody involved in um, the legal, um, you know, area. I mean, anybody who's using evaluation is aware of COVID nineteen, and I, I. I just have to think that their first question is going to be, does this include or exclude any accounting for COVID? And did you use a DCF or are you looking at past performance and modifying it in some way? I mean, I think those are the first two things that they're going to ask. And if we don't have an answer for them, then shame on us. I think it, we, we're going to look silly if we don't have the answer. Well, we've got a question here that's related to this. If there is a material change in valuation, don't we have an obligation to advise all parties who we agreed to have a report distributed to being notified of that change? We're kind of on this topic now. Well, I, I think the purpose might drive the answer to that question. So, you know, if, if the purpose um, is for people to be making decisions and they've not made the decision yet, I do think, you know, we have to take a step back and think, you know, if they're making a decision, whether it's a litigation issue or, you know, to, to sell the business, something like that, we probably should, um, and I'll say should, cause I don't, there's very few absolutes in valuation, but we probably should reach out to them and tell them, Hey, that number had no accounting for COVID and the impact that might have at the same time, they probably know <laughs> they will probably be reaching back to us going, well, this is the old number. What's the new number. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think there's a, an important distinction that has to be made between what was known and knowable and using data that was for something that was known and knowable at that time and that data then changes. I think that there's, there's a, a definite disconnect there that we have to make sure people understand. If there's something that gets updated in March for something that we thought about that was not known or foreseeable on December 31st, then I, I think that you need to know what that is, but you don't change your report for that. Mm -hmm. But if in fact, or at least in my opinion, at least if that number was something that I was using, some type of information that I had and it was known and foreseeable and that, that information changed or was updated, by all means, you need to take that into consideration in my opinion. Yeah, you have to make a clear it distinction was between was material, wasn't it? information you relied upon that was known to you when you did your work versus information that you became aware of afterwards that you did not rely upon. Right. And that would be a subsequent event. Right, exactly. Right. But I guess the, the issue too, I think the question used the word material, Brian? Yes. All right, so, you know, right there, the word alone tells you that, hey, you know, I better look under the hood again because that word is a pretty strong word. Right. Um, well, it's just a matter of what was materially changed. If it wasn't known or foreseeable, then no matter how materially it changed, I don't think it ultimately alters that that number. However, that being said, if it was known and, and, and foreseeable on that December 31st and you used an alternative source and a that source changed their information and it was material, I think that's a big deal. Right, right. but that's going to be an issue between attorneys with the court, right? I mean, if we know it and we, we don't think it should change because it wasn't known or knowable and they're going to argue it, you know, we at least should understand there may be an impact, but that's going to be more of a legal issue that they're going to fight over than where we're at. But yeah, at least once more, right. Once more of a subsequent event though. Right. And, and they got to deal with that. And then if they want to do that, they can change the date. Right. Well, and just keep in mind that when we're, when we, you know, cause the question was, as we as an analyst, you know, what should we do? What should we be doing? We need to have those conversations, but keep in mind that to help us with those conversations, there are regulatory bodies out there who allow for um, moving the date. And so we might be say in a marital dissolution case in a state that says the valuation date has to be the date of separation. Okay, that's before COVID-19 hit, whatever. But is arguing with the attorney is not really the position I wanna be in, but telling them, hey, there's a compelling reason why we need to change the valuation date. And look, the IRS, the biggest user of valuation reports in the US, um, allows for an alternative valuation date when you have an estate, as an example, to account for unknown or subsequent events. Uh, the Department of Labor allows for interim period valuations when significant events occur within the business. And that could be three months later, it could be two months later, it could be one month later. So these are two big 
government entities that are high users of valuation work, right? And if they would allow in whatever circumstance that the valuation analyst or the company deems appropriate to use a different valuation date, then potentially that marital dissolution case, that court judge is gonna say, okay, yeah, we normally have the valuation date as the date of separation. Let's move everything to a different date. That was the key, Larry. You said move everything, right? right. And it's not us that determine the date. It's somebody else. Try our fact, and you can make the argument with the attorneys, but the attorneys are the ones that are going to make that argument. Yeah. So you have two challenges with that. First and foremost is if they are the advocate for their client and you're talking to the attorney and you believe you should change the date, then if, in fact, that is not in the best interest of their client because it's a much higher number for whatever the reason be, right? then you're going to have that argument and they're, and they're going to want to do what they believe is right or wrong. So we don't really make that call. We can make the argument, but we don't make the call to change the date. So just right. make sure that everybody applies the reports that are specific to those dates and times and then are true to their opinions. No, we, we just bring up the issue and let right. them make the decision. Right, exactly. Uh, one other it? thing, uh, I, it's important that we get in front of all of this and given that the, the inputs are changing, given that the industry information is changing, given that what we're getting from our research sources, given that all of that is being updated, we need to let our attorneys know going in that it is likely that there are going to be reasons that we may want to take another look at the values and that they need to be thinking about this in terms of establishing the dates and in, in terms of establishing how they want to go about strategizing their cases and which time frames work for them with the understanding that we just have to be honest and straightforward and be there to support our opinions. Right. I mean, everybody should be talking to the attorneys now. They have a March 31st date. What are we thinking here? Is that really a, a great option? Unless you have to have March 31st, maybe we need another three months to figure this out to have better data and to get a better conclusion. I think those conversations need to be had. Well, there's a related question that's come in. Um, valuation in this climate is akin to business interruption rather than going concern performance and activity. How do we reconcile the two on a reasonably defensible basis? That's a great question. And, and I'll just start off again, but uh, I think Honestly, I think, um, what do we do when we have business interruption, right? We, we look at what the past is, performance has been. We look at the period of time when the performance is, is not normal. And then we look in the future and say, you know, what have we achieved since then? Or what do we think we'll achieve, you know, post that? And I think it's that, that last scenario that we're all sitting in right now with businesses is we're not done with COVID and the impact, but we can now at least start trying to model in some things like the impact that the PPP might have. Did the company participate in that program? Are they using at least 75% of those resources for the right purpose? Is there a likelihood that they're gonna have debt forgiveness? And you know, all of those things are gonna then be changing what that forecast model looks like. We're gonna put in that they, they received the monies. We're gonna put in that it will be forgiven. Maybe there's a probability that it won't because they really didn't perfectly comply right when they got the, the, the monies. So we might have to put in, maybe there's a 20% chance that it won't be forgiven and they, they are gonna, that's gonna be impacting our net free cash flow to the company, right? So, so that's a, it's a great question that, and, and I like the correlation to business interruption. I would say when we're, you know, if we could just t all jump in a time machine together and let's go to you know January 2023 and look back. I would say our conversation is going to be us going, oh, you just give zero weight to 2020, maybe even zero weight mm -hmm. to 2021, mm -hmm. right? Or what were we thinking back in 2020? <laughs> on the on the business interruption claim thing, I think it's important also to realize that uh, if a business, if you're valuing a business and there's a business interruption issue, and let's say they have insurance and their insurance policy provides for some type of recovery, I think we need to be real careful uh, to, to look at that policy, see exactly how those provisions are worded, get legal counsel interpretation about the contract, and understand that um, 
we, I think most of us feel that there's a likelihood that insurance companies may balk at immediately paying some of these claims. So that may affect your cash flows. And uh, there have been a lot of court cases, you know, where companies have wound up going bankrupt as a result of not getting a, a, a claim paid uh, timely. So uh, I think if you have a policy, if you have a business with a policy with business interruption protection, don't automatically assume that's going to come into your cash flows. Right. You know, talk to legal counsel, um, talk to the client, try to get a, a pretty good position as to whether you think there'll be some cash coming in in the near term or not. Yeah, no, and Greg, I think that's a great point. And one of the things that's important for everybody to understand is, again, getting back down to the entity. Just because you received the PPP dollars that came in, then you have to ask yourself, is it going to be forgiven or not? Let's right. say, for example, it's not forgiven. Let's say that your employees aren't coming back and you can't get your employees back and they don't fix that provision and therefore it becomes a loan. Well, that's a completely different picture as to whether or not those people were able to work from their home and be able to generate some revenue, right? Like some yeah. service people versus a manufacturing company where they got that and be able to put their people on, but weren't able to manufacture any widgets. Mm -hmm. The difference between those two things is, is really severe in their revenue cycle. But then let's even go back one step further. If in fact the companies did in fact be able to pay their employees over that period of time and it wasn't forgiven, it doesn't mean that they got any money at all for all the other things that they needed to do, right? The rent, the utilities and all those other things that, so mm -hmm. there's gonna be a capital infusion that's gonna be necessary to keep yeah. that company going. Just because they went net net zero on the payroll doesn't mean that they have all the other costs or the money to be able to do that. So these are all answers that you have to look at for each individual company. Now, the other side of that is if you were able to bill and you were able to do that and your, your payroll was covered and then it was forgiven, you might have a windfall because ultimately you were able to get all those billable hours with zero cost or minimal cost to that payroll. So you need to identify exactly what's happening and make, be ready to make normalization adjustments to try to figure this out. And, well, and, and on those normalization on adjustments, plus. don't forget that there's a tax shield that these businesses will have at the end of the year because you have a dollar to pay for payroll. You have the payroll expense. The dollar came from the government. They forgive the loan. You paid the expense. So you would think it's net neutral, but the company then gets to write off the fact that they paid a dollar in payroll. So there's a tax shield. So yeah. we're, we're subtracting out and saying, okay, whatever our revenues and cash flow are, let's reduce that by the money that we got from the program. But we also need to remember to, uh, you know, tax affect that in some way. Well, let's make it practical so people get it, right? The payroll protection program. How many people miss the value of an NOL carry forward added to a business? That, that, that's it in a nutshell. I wanted to get back to where Greg, Craig, what Greg was with the uh, business interruption stuff. I've been reviewing a lot of policies for clients and people and chances are they don't have coverage right now unless they have an all occurrence policy because since Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the policies have these um, virus and ba uh, bacteria exclusions mm -hmm. and there's a lot going on in state legislators around, legislatures around the country, but that's beyond the scope of today. Brian can tell you that there's an upcoming webinar dealing directly with business interruption issues and that anybody who has questions on those issues, that's the place to get those answers. Yeah, actually that webinar was yesterday. yesterday. Um, they can see it again, right? They can play it. It is posted, it is or will be posted uh, for all of you to view on the NACVA um, COVID-19 page. Um, there is a 10 hour on demand webinar series um, covering very specific issues of interruptions and claims um, that's available through our CPE on demand library. But uh, there is a free two hour webinar specific to COVID and business interruptions, lost profits available or will be for you all to view on that page. Another good question here. Is there a standard COVID-19 statement that should be included in reports at this time? Oh, well, the IRS, the IRS, the AICPA on their website, getting my authoritative bodies mixed up here. <laughs> um, the AICPA on their website, they have a toolkit for COVID-19 and they have toolkits for tax, for the PPP, for valuation, 
for forensic services. And yes, so you can go in and you can get that language and they don't have just like one set of, you know, one paragraph, there's multiple options. So go investigate that. That's um, a really good resource. And the key word there was should, you know, we'll get into the legal definition, you know, should and may, you can include it if you so choose to do it. There's no requirement that you have to. Well, but I, I do think it's, you know, we're probably all going to be mentioning, you know, we're going to have that acronym in our report somewhere. COVID is going to probably be it there. And since somebody else has already thought long and hard about it, we can take that and just make it better. <laughs> but at least it's a starting point instead of a blank page. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I think most of us are going to address it. I wanted to say one thing uh, when Mark was talking about the forecasts and projections, I think it's more important because of all these uncertainties that, that we don't just look at a P and L cash flow uh, presentation or work, but we roll that into a balance sheet and we actually see what the balance sheet looks like during these projection periods to make sure that the cash flows are making sense. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's easy for us to make mistakes with all the uncertainty that's involved. And I would just encourage everyone to be more thorough with that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think I'd like to reiterate something that was very important that Laurie said when she talked about those restaurants. And in a matter of two weeks, the difference between them being around and not being around was double. And, and think about that for a minute when you're looking at your projections. A difference in two weeks, and the answer was twice as many restaurants would not open. So when you're looking at all this data, you don't think that two weeks matters or, or three weeks matters. It does. So when they're trying to update all this industry research and all this other information and forecasting, that's the type of volatility that we're dealing with right now. And you have to be really alert because one week, two weeks, three weeks is a big deal. And, and one way to be looking at that too is depending on if you're looking at your industry data and you notice that you have really small margins. So restaurants are a great example. They just, they live on small margins, honestly. And within restaurants, fine dining establishments are doing a little bit worse now than um, businesses that were kind of set up with to go, you know, systems in place already. And so when you have an industry or a company that has such, you know, such narrow margins at the end of the day, you take two months of their, their 90%, you know, less revenue than they would have had. Sure, there's some cost savings because they're not buying all of the food, but many of those businesses are, still have those orders on contract. And in, instead of facing a force majeure, they're still buying it and then giving out the food. So there's a double dip. Not only do they not have the revenue, they still have the cost. So when you have that, that weird tsunami of events you know, in your fact pattern, you really need to pay attention to what is the company's specific working capital ability to sustain that. I have a question. How should I handle evaluation of a summer seasonal business that should have began in April but couldn't? Now the venues are canceling events for summer and their season for revenue ends in September. If the revenue for 2020 is zero, how do you begin to make the adjustment for this zero dollar year? This is very likely for other industries overall. Otherwise, the business was profitable. I would say you have to look and see, do they have the ability to just have a non-rev year? I mean, if that's their season, and in, here in Colorado, we have that. We've got, you know, ski industries that they had to shut, you know, they had some revenue because they, you know, operated for a while, but then they shut down. So I, I think you have to look at that company and say, you know, do they have the ability to weather until next season? And also keep in mind that there's going to be pent up demand for business, entertainment business types that are seasonal in nature. And so maybe do they have some mitigating revenue that they could earn doing things online? I was reading a story um, yesterday evening about a uh, company that normally does um, ranches for children who have disabilities. And the, the children can't be all together right now, but they're all doing, doing the camping online, setting up little tents inside their living rooms and you know streaming and stuff. And now whether they're charging the same or going to make the same amount of money, probably not, right? But they're at least keeping the connection with the client and that client relationship intangible is probably what makes that company valuable. Mm -hmm. 
So the next year when they actually can have the camping season, there's probably going to be much, you know, there's, they still have that connection. So, so I think it's a great question on the seasonal type businesses and when the season's just carved out, I think you have to look at, can they survive it and can they keep that client relationship till next year? I think this is the highlight um, to me that demands we drill down into the nuts and bolts of the business. We have got to understand this business better probably than we have in the past when we've been doing valuation work. If I was uh, a buyer of business and, and we are hypothecating, uh, you know, a, a willing buyer, willing seller, both informed people who buy businesses, they know a lot about the business. They know a lot about the industry. They learn about the customers, the vendors, the services, the products. And when things like this happen and business owners have to become innovative and think of new ways to do things, as Laurie was explaining, we need to drill down into that to see exactly who those customers are likely going to be. What are those products or services going to be if they're different from the past? What kind of cost structure is going to tie to that? And you've got to really look closely as you build out those projection models each month that they make sense to you. Right. And if you're doing the DCF, maybe that, that year is zero, but then you have to take a look at all those other factors, right? The capex is necessary to come back, the risk with being able to, the cash flows, all of those di different attributes is going to be set up in year two, three, and four. And then maybe some terminal value that you have where everything kind of gets back to normal, but you have to take a look and see if that's even accessible. Will they even survive? Right. Right. Well, so and we'll I think you're probably going to, have to go back to prior years too. I think that historical comparative to the industry is going to be much more important. I think many analysts kind of think about valuation. They'll use maybe the most recent year of industry data and they'll do ratio analysis on just the most recent year. What I think is going to be, you know, really telling is to go back three or four years when pre COVID, what were the trends and was this company fitting in with the industry there? Because if we're going to use the industry data to rely on what we think will happen with the company going forward, do we include or exclude 2020, you know, whatever, I think it's going to be much more, you know, compelling for us to establish the lockstep pattern that the company has had in the past with that same industry group, yeah. right? Yeah. You need to know your benchmark, right? This is where we were. This is how we understood where we were. And then how do we get back if we have to? And, it, and what's it going to cost us to get back and how much capital and working capital is going to be there? You know, and some that might of the very well support your company specific risk. You know, so my risk is different than the industry risk. We have industry expectations, but my risk might be higher or lower given these elements that I've identified in the past. Right. Some of these companies that have been closed for a while, it might be like almost startup costs again. You know, that they have no inventory left and now they got to replenish their inventory to start with no cash flow coming in. Can they do it? You know, how are you going to get those resources? In the restaurant industry where they announced all the meatpacking plants are closed and maybe down for a period of time, it, it's, it, it's in flux. Everything is in flux. Everything we're talking about, you know, we don't have all the answers today. Well, it's yeah. a supply chain, right? It comes right back to the supply chain, regardless of where it's coming from. I read how many they killed, how many tens of thousands of chickens and pigs because they were ready for market, but the plants were closed and they weren't putting them back on the farm. So they had to just dispose of live inventory. Same it, with milk, right? Milk and any crops are being, you know, pretty much turned under or, or burned. So there's a lot in the supply. There's a lot of stuff in disruption in the supply chain that hasn't even filtered into the market yet. Right. Exactly. Well, but for a specific business, though, so some of those that haven't filtered in, we're going to have a harder time grappling with those. But, but I think we're going to have to pay much more attention to our management interviews as well. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a business owner, you guys brought up two important things I want to just kind of flesh out a little bit. If you have a business owner who has emotional fatigue, you know, they're, they've been in the business, they started up the business, they've been through the startup process, now they've had, you know, 20 years of experience as a restaurant owner, for example. Do they even just have the wherewithal to just pick it back up and restart it again? Or are they just going to walk away? So I, I could, I don't know what we would call it. I don't think we would call it COVID fatigue as an additional risk factor, but I do expect that those specific company risk factors, you know, we don't want to double dip, don't want to include it in the cash flow and in the risk, but I would expect that those industry um, factors and the company specific factors relating to management's tolerance 
for starting back up again are going to be key. We just had the question about the seasonal company and they can't, you know, the season goes April to September and they can't do it. You know, the question is, is are the business owners of that company actually willing to wait? You know, could the, could the company itself survive the, the one year of cash flow missing? Probably. But are the business owners willing to stick around until next year or 2022? Yeah, so, That's an investment so, platform, right? Yeah, exactly. That's their investment. Do they want to stick it out or do they want to take their money elsewhere, which they have the right to do? Right. It might be an opportunity exit to try something new, right? They'll become a restaurant, restaurant pandemic consultants. <laughs> Got a comment or question here. How would you handle a DCF when there are so many unknown factors such as consumer behavior for revenue, vendors, and new normals for COGS and expenses, cost of goods and expenses. Also, there's a possibility that there might not be a vaccine or virus, or the virus might mutate or curve might rise, and we can be in the same situation at the end of this, continuing to the next year. Well, the answer is, is simple. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen, but it goes right back to the standards and sufficient relevant data. And at the end of the day, as an expert, you have to rely on your own informed judgment. Believe what your judgment tells you and stand behind it. You're going to be challenged. Be prepared to be challenged. Um, can two reasonable people see things totally differently? Yes. You can have another expert who totally disagrees with where you are. But if you're looking at the same information, those disagreements shouldn't be severe. And if they are, then there's something else driving the delta. But we don't know the answers. The best we can do is work with the information we have. Any subsequent information that comes out on a forward-looking model, DCFs challenge. Now is the time to challenge your client on their DCF model. And also, you know, don't forget, we, we talked about this yesterday between all of us, but you know, it remains to be seen if COVID is a hammer or a sledgehammer on business growth going forward. You yeah, know, and, and I think I, the sensitivity is don't just blame everything on COVID. You I, have to pay attention to certain industries were already in a decline heading into the last quarter last year. So I think that goes back to my earlier comments. You really need to pay attention to when you're pulling your industry sur you know, survey data as of your valuation date pull the prior couple of reports to see what the trends were so that you don't blame it all on COVID in some ways. But back to the question about revenue and expenses and all the unknowns, put together a probability weighted model. Now, Hubert, you, I have, I love your example. So I wanted, I want you to talk about your example that had the 13 different numbers. That's probably yeah. overboard. Right. But, yeah. but I think, um, a probability weighted model is relevant. So Hubert, tell us about your 13 different numbers. We, we, we had a, basically it was a, a shareholder dispute where um, a company was in the tech space and we did our valuation model using a standard waterfall analysis and, and valuations to shares that were not in the money and all the different scenarios that would have to have help them get into the money. And, and our model basically showed that this company that has zero value today would have to get to 15 billion in market cap for the value to fall to the participants who were unhappy. And, you know, we, we did the analysis and, and we were conservative. We weren't overly aggressive, but even if we carried our model out and we showed the client and the attorney, you know, they got to get to 15 billion and, and, and you're not even in a billion in market cap for them to participate. They hired, um, a firm that was a bunch of people who were supposed to be specialists in the tech industry come in with a, um, their estimate, you know, this is in, 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 in mediation settlement talks and their values from 1.4 uh, billion to 13, no, the damages are 1.3 million to 13.5 million using their analysis and their market cap to get to that number for that person had to be in excess of $20 billion. And I'm like, well, might as well just get a dartboard and, and pick which one you want because, you know, but to go from a million to 13.5 million for basis of settlement to settle something, you can't even have a conversation on that difference. Um, you say the case was settled favorably for my client when we were able to point out when people do those probability models, the issue is the sensitivity of them. So when you go from a million five to 13.5, you don't have to make major tweaks to really, um, work the number into different scenarios. So if you're going to do those, that type of modeling, 
just understand what you're doing and, and just take a reasoned approach. People can always attack your assumptions and that's fair game. But, you know, you could attack their assumptions. And if the two analysts are using the same sort of assumption, just using different variables for their, their driver, you know, that's where you can have the, the intellectual discussion as to why your number is better than theirs or theirs is overly speculative. And I think also in, in looking at alternative approaches in, in the projections, be really careful to, to work with management to build projections of revenues and expenses that you think make sense under reasonable assumptions. I know some of them will be hypothetical, but when it comes to whether the recovery is a U or a W or an L, try to build that more into your risk adjustment. Be careful not to double dip. Don't say risk is gonna be greater and cash flows are gonna be lower and therefore you've double dipped and double uh, reduced the value of the business. So just try to keep that separate in your mind, I, I would suggest. You know, one of the things that I think is really important too when you're doing these forecasts is to benchmark where you've been. You need that historical base. And then from that point, build out these forecasts so that you can make a reasonable argument as to how much the difference is going to change as a result of any particular event. In this particular case, it's the virus, right? So if in fact we're to go from point A to point B, then you need to at least know where you were historically to see if that's even viable to make sure that that reasonable rationale that you're making to bridge that gap even works, right? You got to tell them how you're going to bridge the different pieces before it becomes unreasonable, right? And, yeah. and just like Hubert was talking about, when you had these different wide ranges, you got to somehow get those wide ranges down. And it's basically because of, of this particular component or that particular component. And then you take it piece by piece make all your assumptions that are reasonable by each one of them and then do the valuation issue because you pull it all together. First, it's CapEx, right? Understand what it's going to cost us for CapEx. Understand what it's going to cost us for working capital. Work it all the way through and then put the whole piece together. Don't look at it like one big puzzle. You got to put them all together and then build the puzzle and then put your conclusion together. Here's a comment. How, am I muted? Okay. How do you want to address a most probable, a best case scenario, and a worst case scenario, and apply probability analysis? For some cases, might you recommend a Monte Carlo analysis? Let me jump in here. If you're doing a best case, a worst case, and most probable, that's great when you're trying to sell the when you're trying to settle the case. When you're in settlement negotiations and you're meeting with your people and you, you talk to the people on your side of the case and you get their inputs and you bring all of it together and you get their thought process, mm -hmm. uh, you, you get them thinking in terms of what the numbers are likely to be under these various scenarios. Mm -hmm. But when you move into a situation where you are the expert and you have to opine as to what the value is, or you have to opine as to what the damages are, you need, you need to take a position. Mm -hmm. You can consider the best case, the worst case, the most probable, but you need to take a position. But and if you don't know that position, we use the Monte Carlo analysis in the middle. Remember that two people could look at the same data and change and tweak a couple of assumptions and you can come up with a different result in a Monte Carlo analysis and evaluation. So I, I think you, you could consider best and worst case and mid-level, but if you run that through a simulator, there's other variables that go in there that will drive the result. And, you know, it's not the inputs that everybody fights over. It's what other variables that are put into the inputs that are subjective, because that's what it's going to drive wherever the number goes. And that's usually where the, the argument is, but to say worst case, best case, middle of the road, and, and that gives you the right answer, that's not true either all the time. Well, and, and it's important. The things that you can, you have to identify what are the most material drivers. I, I think Hubert was right on there. You have to identify the most material drivers of your valuation or damage calculation, what, regardless, and, and know what causes the biggest movement and do a sensitivity analysis so that you know those things. That will help you define what the, the uh, scenarios are that you run, if, if you do run any sort of range. And I think it's relevant, too, right? I, I, sorry, I think it's relevant to say that um, on April 21st, the SEC actually 
has come out and given um, some proposed new regulations on valuation under the 1940 Act. And this Act may not be relevant or, you know, you know, kind of overlaying any regulations on the work that we're doing on a regular basis. But one of the things that came out of that that I thought was really interesting and it's on point to this conversation is that in that proposed release, what the SEC is saying is that it's not going to be sufficient as an example to simply state that private equity investments are valued using a DCF model or that any options are being valued just using a Black Shows model. Right. What they're saying is you need to provide additional detail on the specific, very specific qualitative and quantitative factors that are going to be considered. So just having a model that you, you know, it's like making sausage, right? We all know how that goes. <laughs> um, so just having the model and you're running it through might not come out with the right thing. And so the SEC is saying, hey, it's not sufficient to do that. Right. You need to, you know, you need to have information on the sources, the methodologies, the inputs, the assumptions, description of how it was calculated and performed, and error rates that might occur if you're using models. I'm going to make a quick comment here because there's a lot of folks asking about CPE and missing the polls um, and how they're going to get credit. Uh, please. Um, be engaged with the webinar. Polls are gonna come up intermittently. We cannot pre-announce them. Um, if you miss the poll, um, send a comment to our moderators through the Zoom webinar chat, um, and we can certainly work with you um, if you miss a poll, but you do have to respond to all poll questions to get the CPE credit for this free webinar or respond or let our moderators know um, that you missed a poll and they can track that when we're posting CPE. Just wanted to jump in there because there's quite a lot of questions or comments about CPE. Um, so jump back in here, you guys, sorry to. So, uh, Brian, I just want to finish up my, my little thought on this because I'm, I'm like squirrel and we get interested in something else. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to finish my thought on this that, <laughs> that that comment about the DCF and what the SEC was talking about and don't just use models and, and you have to support everything you also might be considering that your probability weighted model is not just three different ways that the DCF might go. What you might be saying is there's a 20% chance that this business is going to go under. So I'm going to rely on my asset approach 20%. So it's not just a complex Excel, you know, modeling concept, right? There, there may be some other ways that you're going to be weighting these, the risk and the probability. And one of them might be, there's a risk that the business won't come back, can't come back. Um, won't be able to, you know, meet their obligations. Right. And a, a practice pointer. How many people have seen, they put their report out, it's 18 pages or 20 pages with um, your exhibits and, and you think you've said everything. And all of a sudden the other side comes, you get slammed with a 230 page report that has iterations out the wazoo. And listen, doing all these iterations of, of a Monte Carlo with all these assumptions doesn't mean it's right. Seeing a report that's a hundred and, 80 pages longer than your report doesn't make that report right. It's the expert who understands what they did, they considered it, and they can stand behind it. It always comes back to, you're the advocate for your work product. And, you know, when you talk about all these questions and all these models, if you don't understand them, don't do them. Second of all, if you've done them and you understand them, be prepared to be challenged on them. But a, a lot of what we're talking about comes back to the individual expert. And you being able to stand behind your product understand what you've did and you can't say, well, I heard this on a webinar or I read this in an article. You can reference it. That's great. But if you don't understand it, just like the data sources, understand how they got it. It may not all be right, but at least understand where they got it and make sure you employed it. I mean, I've seen times where people rely on the sources and it says one thing about the economy and the business impact or the industry impact and their clients performing below that. But all the outliers look good for my client because the industry is going on an upward trend. Well, your client isn't keeping up with the industry or it may be going negative soon, you have to reconcile that. So understand everything you do falls on your shoulders. There were some other data sources we were going to um, bring into this conversation. Uh, did you want to jump into one or more of those? So this stats, this is one resource that um, honestly, I find some valuation analysts are not familiar with it. They're, they're familiar with BizMiner um, or Integra, but not BizStats. 
And BizStats is actually a free resource. I like to point my clients um, here, you know, when they have questions and they don't want to pay for me to do an analysis or something. But this is a free resource for statistics and financial ratios. And if you're not aware of it, this is the resource that the IRS uses internally as well. At least that's my understanding. Um, I do think we have a few people from the IRS that are watching or participating. And so if you, if you have any more insight on that, that would be great if you use it or if it's just based off your data, that would be relevant. But um, we wanted to bring this one out that it is a free resource. And so when we're thinking about some, some of us may be focused on M&A work and M&A work um, might not be as robust right now as some of the other valuation litigation work that we might be doing as consultants. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing that you could be doing is, you know, pulling information, say, from BizStats and doing some benchmarking with the company historically to just give them some feedback on where they are, where they might be. But this is a, a pretty good resource. Mm. We do have another question. In many cases, won't the premise of value change from going concern to liquidation and out valuations? How and when do you make that determination with a client or business that it is on the fence and isn't just filing for bankruptcy? First of all, most times in bankruptcy, many times it's not the client's choice to file for bankruptcy. They're right. pretty far down the road and other people are kind of forcing them there. Um, so, you know, making, you know, that's a different, when we talk about um, premise of value, kind of like going concern and, and, and not, you know, that's something we would have to consider is the liquidation value more than a going concern value, but that requires a full discussion with management and the owner and, and you know, what are their ability to keep the thing going? We saw a lot of this in, in the, the late nineties with the, uh, the go-go tax, right? Everybody, the dot coms are going crazy. Burn rates through the roof, negative cash. They might people pouring money in and they were getting quali unqualified audit opinions. All of a sudden fast forward two and a half years later and all of a sudden they're getting the going concern opinions because you know, somebody finally woke up and said, we don't think they can continue the burn rate and they're eventually going to run out of investors to pump money into this thing. It's a conversation with a client. How long can you keep this business alive? What's your plan to turn the corner? And if they don't have that plan and they don't have the resources, where are they going to get their capital acquisition? Today, it's going to be a very hard discussion on capital acquisition. Are they going to infuse it or get it from the bank? And if they don't have it, getting it from the bank ain't going to be so easy. Well, and I think that's where Greg's com comment about when you're doing a DCF, don't forget to throw the, the results of that back on the balance sheet, because that would at least test the theory of can they survive, right? Yes. Another thing I do when I'm trying to make that decision is I look at the Altman Z-score. It's something I used as an auditor when I was auditing financial statements, you know, early in my career, but I actually am using it right now uh, in evaluation that I'm doing uh, because the company's in a compromised position. And if you're not familiar with the Altman Z-score, you can Google it. Um, a guy named Altman created an analysis that has held up over time that is an indicator of uh, the likelihood that a business may go into bankruptcy within the next two years. Mm -hmm. So that would be something that might be helpful to you. Well, the IRS used to like it too, to do the reasonable comp analysis on C-Corps if they were not paying enough fair compensation and distributing it as dividend. Be careful um, on the Altman Z that you're pulling the appropriate formula because Altman Z that was originally created to test public companies that were in the manufacturing space, whether or not they would be going bankrupt. And uh, the gentleman who um, created that actually has come out with two or three other formulas and models. And so the inputs are different. So you need to make sure that you're using the right one for manufacturing, non-manufacturing or a private company. But I think, Greg, your point is great on the Altman Z-score because how many times do we do the ratio analysis and the common size? And we've seen people where it just sits there. And when you look at the common size, some of these ratios jump out at you and you're like, well, how come they didn't mention that? You know, didn't they realize that the, the quick ratio was dropping? You know, their days in receivables have been increasing. Their debt to equity, you know, something's good something's fundamentally changing and you don't see it on the real numbers on a balance sheet as well. You see it in the common size and same with the, uh, the income statement, you know, what's going on with the, the gross profit, what's going on with some of the um, overhead expenditures. I mean, there's a story that's told in a lot of what we've done, which goes back to, you know, the sufficient relevant data and the standards, you know, you could write the nicest report and talk about the cash flow, but if there's things that are bubbling beneath the surface that you don't reconcile or address, those are going to come out. A good 
opposing experts going to point them out? And so is a good um, attorney that you're working for or a good cross-examining attorney? Well, did you give consideration to this and this? So we do a lot of things when we do our work. Just understand, you need to understand everything that you've done. You do. Yeah, and sometimes the results are simply interpreted too. I mean, if, if your income and market approaches come in less than your asset approach, unless it's an asset intensive business, it could be a sign that it's worth more debt than alive. So you have to be careful there. It doesn't mean that all the time, but pay attention to the results of your analysis as well. Right. And it's not always a time to panic either, right? Because if you're looking at some of these balance sheet ratios, what are the balance sheet ratios showing us? Something as a snapshot at a point in time where the income statement ratios are telling us something that happened over a period of time. So if there's something off kilter between the 1231, 18 and 19 balance sheet, it just could be a timing difference that would have worked itself out in the first week of January. So those are the things that people have to look at too. If some of these ratios are off and, understand the full story at both ends of what happened. And there's a comment um, that you may want to test covenants in your analysis as well. What are your comments about that? What's that, Mark? What do you guys believe the, the answer is to benchmarking with the financial ratios that we currently have ahead of us with the new information in our forecasting? I think you have to be careful when those dates and when they are actually prepared because they might be all out of whack, don't you think? Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, it's the old um, litigation answer. It depends, right? We don't know the answers. And yeah, we don't know. But going back to what Laurie said, we could be sitting here in 2023 saying, huh. wow, it, it, it isn't as bad as we thought it was. Uh, or it's, oh, it's a lot worse than we thought it was. Right. So we don't know. Right. Well, to the question that was posed, I mean, absolutely, I think you need to look at the loan covenants. Mm -hmm. And you know, is a company in compliance with them at the valuation date? Are they out of compliance? You know, what are the consequences? What's the likelihood that uh, the bank may call the debt? You know, if it's a highly leveraged business in this COVID-19 environment, you know, they could really be in trouble. So I, also, I, how often has the bank granted waivers in the covenants? Because that's one of the things that weakens some of these covenants is the bank grants the waiver because they have the personal guarantee. And listen, banks are not in the business of foreclosing on business owners. Uh, they want to get their money. And right. if they have to extend the time and lower the payment, they want the cash flow. Um, so that's a whole, it's an important thing. To, but if the bank's willing to work with them and it's extended those covenant um, waivers for a period of time, then it comes back down to the cash flow. You know, how long can this business owner maintain the bleeding until he thinks it, or she thinks it's going to heal? And it gets back to the importance of really looking at the company itself that you're valuing, digging into it, understanding everything about it that you can. Hmm. Right. We have a good question here. It's a pretty long one. So follow with me or if you all are panelists, check in the, in the Q&A box. <laughs> Based on reported quarterly earnings of the S&P, the long-term historical cap rate of the market through December 31st, 2019 was about 4.8%. Based on the TTM S&P earnings on March 31st, 2020, the cap rate was about 6.1%, indicating an increase of the ERP of 1.3%. On a forward-looking basis, the cap rate of the S&P on 331.20 was projected well below the historical average. What are your thoughts regarding reconciling the cash flow and cost of capital interplay reflected in these market conditions? Take a look at that question again. Yeah, I was good until the statement about that the projected performance was well below the historical average. So let's talk in real time. So let's, let's go back to, it was 4.8 versus 6.1. Um, when we're talking about reconciling cash flow in that risk of the cash flow, um, sorry, oh, we have a- Yeah, there's a correction. RE, the 4.8 was as of 12.31.20, that is TTM, not historical. So forward, forward looking. Forward looking. Okay. So I'm, I'm still going with, you know, when we're looking at the interplay between risk 
and the cash flows, we've all said, we, you know, we can't double dip on, on both of them, right? And what we have is evidence from the market. We have evidence from the economy that to me right now isn't real time what the market is doing. You know, if we're thinking about the big drop in GDP mm -hmm. in the first quarter of 2020, I don't know necessarily that the market as a group is reflecting that same, you know, kind of adjustment, but I'm going to go back with, um, you know, Hubert and I are in the same camp. I mean, we just don't know, mm -hmm. but I think the biggest thing is we need to really vet the assumptions that we put into the DCF, make sure they make sense. And along with that probability weighted model, one option is to you to be using different discount rates in those interim periods. Mm -hmm. So my 2020 discount rate tied to what's going on in the market might be different than my 2021 discount rate, my 2022. My DCF may go out to 2026 mm -hmm. and at a point where I think we have stabilized, you know, risk and stabilized cash flows, but my interim cash flows might be discounted back at different risk rates. Right. And, and yeah, I think you hit it right on too, the head. Right? Were we at 19,000 a few weeks ago in the market? Right now, as of today, the, the data was up 645 points at 24.7, and the NASDAQ in New York, they're, they're up. We don't know the answer. Yeah, sorry, Mark, go ahead. No, that's okay. But one other thing I was going to say is, you know, one of the reasons why the, the equity risk premiums are, are this long-term deal. Larry hit it right on the head. If you're going to do a DCF, you have to do a rate that's comparable with that period of time. And I think that you can do that. And I think that as this plays out, that risk is going to diminish to a point where you get to a terminal value and not unlike looking at some of the, the studies on the buildups where, you know, you go back from 1925 that are present to look at that long-term look. I think you need to look at that long-term look and your terminal value is too, as well and adjust that to something that, that looks like it's going to be there under perpetuity, not just for this moment in time. You need to adjust it for each one of those interim periods for that nonlinear growth equation we're trying to figure out. But when you go linear, you got to look at the big long-term program and you got to look at the perpetuity. And that, that one event, this little event that we have today over time is going to be a blip in comparison to everything else that's happened over that period of time as well. All right, we have another question. Since IBIS and similar products, one, are not original source information, two, are not experts vetted and directed by the practitioner for the engagement, three, are not just reporting data, and four, are often at least tax tacitly expressing opinions, how is the use of such third-party products consistent with our professional ob obligations, especially for court testimony? Well, I think that goes, I'll start off again. I think part of the answer to that goes back to, that's why we use multiple sources. I mean, the, the, whoever wrote that question is very insightful, is perfect, that's right, you know, because there is bias in that data, right? There might be a political bias in the person writing up the analysis. Um, Ibis World, as an example, tends to have the same analyst updating the same industry on a regular basis, so you may be hearing their voice and their commentary in there, but that's why we need to pick up different data from different resources to validate that we can use them and rely on them. But secondly, and then I'll pitch to someone else, whoever wants to raise their hand and take it. Um, secondly, we all recognize we don't have perfect data. We don't have perfectly unclean neutral data. And so, you know, this is the best that we have. It's just like saying we're using uh, the guideline public company method to value private companies. Well, we know it's not a perfect correlation on risk, so we have to adjust it in some way, but it's the best we have. So these industry research providers, it's not perfect, but as a profession, we've embraced it. So as it relates to that professional responsibility area of the question, we all kind of have looked at it, picked it up, seen that it's kind of hairy, five-second rule, may use it, may not use it. Mm -hmm. 
I, I agree. Think it, also, I think it also goes to the federal rules of evidence, right? It, it, it's been peer reviewed. It's tried. It's tested. Right. Our peers use the same information. So I, I get it. And, you know, if there's a case or somebody's out there challenging these data sources, you know, that, that's fair game and that's fine. I mean, that's why we said understand what's in it. And, um, you know, then that probably goes for every other third party report that's out there. So if the Federal Reserve puts out the little beige book and we read it, you know, are we reading information that we shouldn't be relying upon? And is it generally accepted within the relevant professional community? But what we have to do, as we've discussed before, is be able to explain how the information was gathered and put together and how we're using it in formulating our opinions. Mm -hmm. I think and also, I think we, Michael, as well, it's how you're going to put it together and how you're using it and how you tell your story and the multiple different sources. Just because we take a particular piece of source of information we don't take it blindly. You still have to apply that information and then you have to explain that application within that, that particular model that justifies that, that approach. Well, we have to get the best available data that we can find. And I think we need to corroborate the various pieces of data together. Um, if you're doing economic research at a national, state and local level and in, in industry research, and they're saying different things, you know, you've got a problem, you've got conflicting information, you need to dig further and try to find information that you think is kind of leading to the same point, telling the same story. And I think that way you can help defend the data that you're relying upon. Mm -hmm. And there's oftentimes multiple data sources that are generally acceptable. And I don't think you should be afraid to admit that. And sometimes the reason that you chose the data source that you vetted and you understand is because the data is more usable for what you were using it for. Right. So I think you don't have to be a diehard fan with your pom-poms out about a particular source of data. You can just say, I chose this because it was more usable in the model or the application that I use it for, as long as you, you know, um, uh, have vetted it and understand how it was created and obtained and, and put together. Right. The questioner who put, posed that question as a follow-up question validating IBIS, et cetera, seems like a bottomless pit for cross-examination peril. And how do you avoid that risk? And, and my experience has been most of the cases that I've been in, the person on the other side is using similar data sources. Yeah. So if they're going to attack me, they have to attack their other experts, or they have to have something that they believe is better. And, and there are competing products, but at the end of the day, if they're close, if somebody says the inflation rate is 2.9% and IBIS says it's 2.9%, the industry growth rate is going to be 7% until 2021. The other person says it's going to be 6.7. I mean, there has to be a wide divergence to attack all that industry data that you're relying upon. And in most of my experiences, I don't see that uh, triers of fact have a lot of stomach for people trying to attack on cross-examination things that are used widely in the profession by other people. I mean, I, I've seen, if somebody wants to go there, I've seen that stuff get shut down rather quickly because they're going to go, well, well, you know, IBIS isn't on trial here. And the data they're, they're reporting is coming from public data sources. But, but the, the one, one thing I have seen fail, though, is where you have an analyst who knew about the data, but they didn't have the subscription. Well, I only subscribe to one instead of the other. I think, you know, 10 years ago, we all probably had the same resources and we all had a canned amount that our library costs. There's so many different resources now, but you need to keep a finger on the pulse of the of profession and what are they using in general. And if you're using one because it's free or it's cheap and you just didn't want to pay for it, that's a completely different ballpark, you know, area of, you know, fodder for cross-examination and for uh, accusing someone of not actually having sufficient relevant data. And That's like doing, like doing a calculation because your client didn't want to pay for evaluation. Yeah. And I've seen the question asked about somebody who didn't have the subscription using a data was, do you often um, violate subscriptions for other users of the product? You know, basically that's a, a piracy act that you're doing. You know, yeah. you often commit federal crimes in the, in the, in the work that you're doing. So yeah. there's ways around that. So uh, that's a good um, punt to another one of the resources that we talked about. Uh... And Brian, before you move off of that, I do want to say that um, BizMiner does own, somebody put this in the chat and it reminded me, I, I know this is true. Um, BizMiner does own BizStats and BizStats tends to lag a little bit. So BizMiner on a fee, you know, it's a fee-based 
resource, um, but they tend to have a little bit more robust information. Just throwing that out there. Thanks, Barry. All right, and the modern. A lot of good stuff here. You guys had a very great conversation about um, Dr. DeModern's data yesterday when we were preparing for, for, for now. Yeah, Lori, you had some good insights on that. Why don't you share those? Go, <laughs> <laughs> Lori. <laughs> oh, you're going to put me on the spot. So uh, <laughs> I will start off with Zach was the one that brought up DeModern's data. <laughs> That's the bus starting, Zach. Hot potato. <laughs> we'll start off with, but um, I, I think anybody on this call who does evaluation, you're familiar with DeModern um, competing uh, different sources of cost of capital data. And one of the cool things about DeModer and his website is he does just have a lot of information out there, you know, free, available. He, he doesn't mind if you use the information, that's great. But just be careful about, um, I hear comments sometimes like, oh, I just use DeModer and data. Look and see what it is that he's um, putting in there, just like any third party resource, but even maybe a little bit more level of skepticism in it. And I'm not saying I disagree with DeModer at all. I think he's awesome and he's got some great work out there. But know what goes into his calculations, know what it means, and understand it, because keeping in mind, Dr. DeModeran is brilliant, and he's done a lot of research that has helped advance valuation as a profession, but what he does for a living is not value businesses. He teaches for a living, and I, I hate, I love to teach myself, and I hate to be in the camp of saying, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach, because I come from a family of academicians as well. Um, but but the academic viewpoint of the data that we need and how we use it and what it means is different than the practitioner viewpoint of what can we justify, how can we defend this information. So it's a great resource. He's got a ton of information. And um, if you're not going to take the time to dig into and spend several hours understanding what he's saying and doing, um, maybe it's a sanity check but it is a good resource. So I, I think I kind of said that the cup is half empty. So Zach, do you want to talk about how full it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I respect the motor in tremendously. And I, and I think that the, the data and the analysis that he puts out there is, you know, it's just like anything else. You have to vet it, obviously. And that, that it doesn't matter whether the data is put out by some huge organization or an individual or a group of three people that just put the data out there. It doesn't matter. You have to vet the data. And, you know, he is a good uh, resource to a certain extent because he has a number of things, apps and websites and lectures for free and things that are very insightful. But I think, just like you guys said, no matter what, you have to vet the data and understand how they obtained it and, and how they're presenting it. That's probably more important than anything. I mean, I've seen people that use data simply because everybody else uses it, but then they get to court and they can't explain why everybody else is using it. I mean, you know, the, I've seen Gamboa Gibson tables where people can't explain why they, they use them or why they're appropriate and their stuff gets thrown out. Whereas a week before that or a week after that, somebody uses the same data and they can explain it and their opinion is, is held up. So it, I think it's not so much, you know, obviously you want to get, data from a reliable source that's generally accepted or used within our industry, but just know like how they use it, why it's useful, how it's obtained. I, I think that's far more important than where you get it from. And it's always great to get it from different sources personally. That's the way I feel. I think you know, it tells you part of our, the truth is. Part of our presentation today is, is focused on the term purpose. And we talk about purpose evaluation, but we also, I think, need to think about the purpose of the data that's being presented. And, and to me, in the world of academia, I think a lot of teachers will throw data out, you know, for their students to do research on and maybe come in and have challenging conversations. And it may not necessarily be Dr. Modern's opinion, everything that you're reading. It could be information that he's using for some other purpose. So um, when I look at Ibis World and these other sources that we've talked about, the purpose of those reports are for us to use in doing the work that we do. It doesn't mean we should close our eyes to other sources, but I think just be mindful. 
It was mentioned that we should have subscriptions for primary most widely accepted data. What is the opinion of must have subscriptions for data and comparison, especially now with constant changes? I think that's the purpose of us showing so many various resources because there's a lot out there. And certainly you all have different budgets for data, um, but there's a lot, some free, some subscription based. Um, it just depends on, on you know, would you all agree or, or what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? I would agree and I'll just throw this out there. I, I think the two most common for industry research, two most common database resources that I see are IBIS World and First Research. Now that depending on the industry, some, some industries are so specialized that even though these companies are out there providing us research, they don't necessarily cover the, the narrow sliver of the industry that we might need. And so in those instances, I do see um, customized industry reports. I, I think that those have a great place, but it, what we really need to make sure, no matter which resource we're using, um, we need to really make sure that we pay attention to their bibliography. Where do they get the information? And do we, do we think that's a good resource? If they're getting their information from a, you know, politically, you know, biased resource, then that's probably going to, you know, go in, in my opinion, to the level of, of, of reliance that I place on it. It doesn't mean I'm going to ignore it, but if I suspect it or if I see it, then maybe that's going to reduce my reliance on that particular resource. There's a number of government resources too. If you're not getting subscription-based stuff, I mean, there's a lot of information out there that the government puts out anyways. You know, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Census, even the IRS. Um, you just got to make sure that it's up to date and and um, you know how it's put together. And understand that. And let's face it, these resources came about because we, well, we, many of us. Zach, you're a little bit younger. So many of us on this call, mm -hmm. I'm not going to call us old. I'm just saying many of us have been around long enough that pre somebody, you know, having a resource package together and we had to do that. I, when I first moved to Colorado 20 years ago, I was the person that was showing up to the state chapter meetings and all I talked about for an hour, an hour and a half was resources on the internet and how to get it. And one of the more popular things that um, I had was I would have a, a Word document with hyperlinks in it on how to get to different websites that had data. And that was really, but that was 20 years ago. Fast forward and here we have Ibis World and First Research and all these, you know, people who go in and do exactly what Zach was saying. They aggregate from that base resource, the BLS, the BEA, wherever it's coming from. But that's where we need to pay attention to the bibliography and see where do they get the information. Another source that's available to NACVA members is an Econocyst subscription with key value data. Um, as Laura was speaking, I log into my account at NACVA.com. And once you log in and click your account, there's a link here that will pass you through to your free Econocyst subscription with key value data. This is included as a benefit of your membership with the NACVA. And once you log in, you re-enter your email address. Which will take you to the Key Value Data dashboard of databases, resources, and applications. All of the sources that are checkmarked in green are those included um, at no extra cost. So you can access BizMiner, although these reports you may have to, um, you have access to them, but purchasing them is at a fee. Also first research, archived industry and metro reports, uh, federal and case law database, and some other resources here. Um, so another great source of data um, for NACVA members uh, to take advantage of if you haven't already as an Econocyst uh, subscriber. And Brian, I hate to just like, you know, switch subjects, but I do mm -hmm. want to go back because somebody has a question in the chat box and then, and then um, after me, Hubert, you've got one that you want to answer, but the question is kind of a follow up to my comment about doing a DCF and having different discount rates, different risk rates for the, you know, interim years until you can get to, you know, a steady state risk. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's a, a valid question. 
and the, the person asking the question says, we don't have any idea how long this is going to last and how it's going to specific, you know, impact specific companies. That's true. Um, if it, for anybody who was not with us on Monday, there's a, there at the very beginning of that. So then the first five minutes, if you just go look at the link in the first five minutes, you should be able to see it. But we had a chart of the, um, uh, SM, of the market basically 1896 to 2016. And it was looking at, I think there was 120 different events that occurred that were human caused events um, and how the market changed and how long it took to recover. And if you going back to 1929 and a bunch of events kind of all cascaded at once, you know, that was a much longer recovery period. Um, and, and so when we think about COVID and we think about what's going on right now, we also probably don't need to ignore things like what's going on with um, oil and that battle that was going on prior to COVID. So we have a couple of layers of things that we have to deal with, okay? But in general, when we're looking at human caused events and you know, this is a pandemic, it's a health issue, slightly different, but the 20, 2008 you know, recovery was about a six year recovery. And so I think even though I may not be able to nail what that risk is in six years, I've always kind of puzzled about that. You know, we use the discount rate of the current market forward looking, and then we say in our sixth year, that's our terminal mm -hmm. risk. Um, and and so, so I think that concept is it's a valid question, but I think if you can use the best information that we have available, we don't know, but we know at least the Lehman Brother crisis, the financial crisis, how long that took to recover. Maybe this will be a quicker recovery. We don't know, but I think that can answer your question a little bit as far as how confident you can be going forward. It's probably no more confident than we ever have been in being able to put on our little, you know, uh, storytelling hat and saying in five years, this is still going to be the risk, even without COVID. I think the key word is confident. You have to be confident with, with, with whatever you choose. So if you believe that it's going to be a year and a half to two year thing and the company is going to be growing and you have data that you believe supports it and the opposing expert has no confidence and believes that, you know, we're spiraling into the abyss for the next five years, at the end of the day, the trier of fact is going to have to make a decision on both experts' information and who the trier of fact views is more credible. So you can't be pie in the sky and you can't be doom and gloom, but whatever way you go, you own it, as Michael says, that Frank's mm -hmm. words, you own it. Be prepared to stand behind it. It doesn't make you wrong. Listen, this isn't about always being right or that you're always wrong. It's being that you're credible because you made a sound decision and employed professional judgment based on information put in front of you and that you're able to articulate it and communicate it to somebody so they understand where you're coming from. That's the don't, key. Don't underestimate the importance of being articulated, of articulating it and communicating it exactly. because often it's the expert who tells the better story, exactly. who explains it in a way that's understandable and can relate to the jury and the judge who is the one whose opinions are embraced. You know, guys, don't, don't forget the fact that we've been doing this forever. We get our, our terminal value and our DCFs. After we get done with that nonlinear growth pattern, and now you're going to go out into the future, how long do we send that DCF out for? Was it always five years or four years or six years? You don't go out usually 10 years because who has a crystal ball for that, right? So ultimately, <laughs> we've dealt with this risk factor for a long time. In, in normal days. So it's really about what's going to happen in the next year, year and a half, two years, and then get back to something, I would say somewhere around that five year period of time to something normal. And I don't know how you go out much further than that, because we've never been able to go out much further than that before. But Mark, so, mathematically, what happens if you go out seven years and you go out 15 years? Right. Most of the value is captured in that first seven years. Right. And you lose your credibility when you go out past year 10 a lot of times, because the the upward trend severely flattens unless you're projecting significant future growth in the out years. Right. But the way, the way to account for that, Hubert, is we make, and I know you, do, you believe this too, you make well-reasoned decisions that support exactly. what you're doing. Yeah. Go back and do what Greg said. Fill yeah. in the balance sheet side. If you're doing that DCF, what is going to happen on the balance sheet? And does it make sense? Right. A way to support that change. People think they have to get to a number, and I have to get to years to get to a number. And that's right. really not the way we do this. 
but don't forget to tell your story about the base of where you've come from, right? If you understand the base of where you come from, making those reasonable assumptions is a much stronger case. If you don't know where you start and you can't explain where you start and you're trying to get somebody to believe you're going to go to, to X or Y, then how do they understand how reasonable that could be if they don't know how far they have to go? So just make sure that you, you tell the whole story, where they've been, where they're going, what the risk, additional risk is, and then how you're going to map out that story. I think to put a little crescendo on what Mark is saying, particularly if we're in a litigation setting, if we get out into that terminal year and our terminal year doesn't look pretty close to what it looked like pre-COVID-19, we better really have some good explanations for why. You know, mm -hmm. There better be some facts that support lost customers or lost vendors or change to justify that, or we're going to have a really hard time defending that against strong cross-examination. Right. It's about your assumptions and conditions, right? I mean, you got to be able to deal with them and make sure that all that stuff works. Right. So what does that mean at the end of the day is, five years from now, your business may not have grown in value, right? And, and, and that's the answer. It might not be the answer the client wants to hear, but it could be one of the possible answers. Mm -hmm. Or it's good that we survive. That a, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> we need to go back with <laughs> Hubert, I think there was a question you wanted to address um, a, bit, a little bit earlier. Oh, I forgot. Did we get to that already? We probably did. I know someone had asked a question on something and, and I responded privately, but the question was really, you know, even if you have the third party data source, isn't it our job to review that information and render our own opinion based on reviewing the data? And I responded, yes. You know, if we, I read an IBIS report and we include excerpts of it in our report, I still have to tie that into the work that I've done or reconcile where there's a disconnect. So that, that, that was the only thing that somebody, the person who was asking about using this stuff and challenging it, we don't just take it blindly and say, okay, I paid you know, a couple thousand dollars and these guys are never wrong. No, we review it and we do the tying into the business or the subject company that we're looking at. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen in reports is to give a lot of data and it's like the checklist, right? I got economic information, check. But, and, they, and they put excerpts of it in there and then they go on, but they never tell you how that, how that affected their ultimate conclusion. That's how did that affect my decisions and my assumptions and all the other things that, that make it worthwhile to this particular report and engagement and, and company or entity? And, and to think that somebody is going to read that and interpret what you did and how you implied that into your calculations is insane. You have to tell that story. And that makes for some interesting cross-examination, doesn't it? Oh, if sure. If the growth rate had been 6.4% rather than 6.1%, how would that affect your opinion? Mm -hmm. Let's see. I, I think one thing to keep in mind while Brian's looking for our next question, too, is that um, I feel like we're all being kind of negative Nellies. There's, there's some businesses out there that short-term are – you know, doing gangbuster kind of work too. Mm -hmm. And, and no different than the companies that are, are suffering right now, those companies, is that sustainable on a forward looking basis? Are they going to forever have that? And the, the answer is probably no, because mm -hmm. maybe some of the other business owners are good entrepreneurs and they're going to come in and fill that space and fill that demand. So I think equally important is for us to recognize that that cost structure going forward, the history is the history we're probably not ever going to be the same after this, but we might, depending on the industry that we're in. Right. But there's probably going to be at least some extra layer of costs associated with most businesses relating to sanitary issues. Um, even once we do get the vaccine, if there's one that's available that, that can be proven that works, right? I, I think that real thought needs to go into that cost structure not just cost of sales, but all the other cost of running and operating a normal business that you have public that come in on a regular basis. I, I don't, I think, you know, the term negative, I don't, I don't, I don't agree that we're being negative. All of us, <laughs> you know, we had an auditing class, right? What, what was one of the first things they told us we had to be if we were an auditor? Conservative. Especially skeptical. <laughs> right? and I think that's what we are by nature. We're professionally skeptical. When people tell us something, everybody puts all the sugar in everything they tell us. Even business owners, when we know the, 
And our job is to, you know, weed through it and go through it. So, you know, even though it may sound like it's negative, we don't know what's going on here, but we're being professionally skeptical. And the worst thing we could ever be is overly optimistic in the work that we do, because that's when we can get hurt. We're dealing with business owners who are overly optimistic. And we've got to, we've got to inject some reality into it. <laughs> and in litigation, they can be overly pessimistic. Depending, depending on upon which side of the case you're on. <laughs> the barbecue on Friday, the business owner says that his business is worth a million dollars. The wife tells him on Sunday after church, he wants to get divorced. Calls you on Monday, said, my business just dropped 700000 <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, we've got about five minutes left um, to wrap up um, this, this series in today's webinar. Again, thank you all of, all of you who've joined us um, through this series and particularly today. And to Mark and Laurie, Michael, Zach, Greg, and Hubert, um, who've given so graciously of their time and their knowledge to share their feedback and comments and advice and answer your questions. Um, as we close this series, um, we'll just give you all this the last uh, moment to wrap up some of the high points of what you'd like to have our viewers take away, particularly from this series or maybe others. Um, and we'll start with Greg. I would say just realize there's no one way to skin a cat um, when, when it comes to all these decisions we're having to make in the post COVID-19 environment. The purpose of the valuation is really going to drive the approaches that we need to take. And I think you need to really focus on why you're, why you're doing your work, who the users are, how you can help them best and, um, and just be thorough, do more research than you've ever done and just keep digging and digging and digging even up until you know close to the time that you're going to be testifying make sure that you've got the best information available to help uh, the parties that you're working with thank you greg zach <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, i feel like the the little kid that finally gets to eat at the adult table with these <laughs> guys so. <laughs> I just want to point out that all of them are, are brilliant, and, I, and I've called them all many times, at many times of the day or night, and, and probably annoyed them, but um, <laughs> listen to everything a couple times. Watch these videos. You can, you can look, at, look them up on YouTube. Watch them however many times you want to, and then make your own decisions. I think Greg was right on. You know, um, do additional research. Pay attention to what you're doing, who, what the use is, who's the user, and uh, I think you'll be all right. I think um, there's been some really great ideas and, and sort of theories and applications talked about in this series, and I would just highly suggest you guys take a, a couple looks at it and, and then determine on your own how to apply the knowledge that everyone shared with you. Right. Hubert? All right. Uh, one, I want to thank uh, the NACVA and especially uh, Greg you know, for reaching out to us all because he brought this to our attention. And, and these webinar series came around as, as a result of him reaching out to us and um, saying, hey, call headquarters. You know, this is something that's timely. And he did that. And that's why we're all here. And I think we put together a great series. Uh, second thing is, while Zach is eating at the table, there's a reason there's a 40 under 40 on the wall behind him, okay? <laughs> he eat too much, and we wouldn't let him at the table, but he's earned it to be at the table. So, Zach, you know, you're very humble, but you're well-respected. And, and just to Brian and the organization, thank you um, for putting this together. I think it's been a great resource for the attendees as well as us because I think we've all learned something from each other. That's right. right. I, I didn't steal your thunder, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? Be professional. Use the best information that's out there. Do your research. Use generally accepted approaches to your valuations, to your damages studies. Be able to tell the story. Subject it all to your common sense. And pick up the phone and call your colleagues. Call your business partners. Get on the phone, 1-800-HUBERT-KLEIN. 1-800-GREG-REG. You know, we... we there's a song coming, guys. Okay. <laughs> well, you want me to, if you want me to sing the NACFA song, I'll bring it all together. We'll close with that, but Michael. So we'll close with it. Hang with us but the, the end. There's the, a cherry on top. 
Uh, we're going to hear a song by Michael, but we're going to we're going to get to that yeah. in just a moment. <laughs> but the bottom line is that the the resources that we have available here are not just data resources or methodology resources or technology resources. We've got people. We've got people who who have had the same struggles that that, that you're having now, and that we have every day. Reach out. You know, one person alone is not as smart as all of us together <laughs> and good things come out of it. Yes. Thank you. you go, Thank you for being here. So Larry. Michael, that, that, that steals my thunder of not <laughs> none of us are as smart as all of us, but it, but it's, it, it's a common thing, the theme that we've had. And, and I do uh, support that. Um, the reason why this has been beneficial for so many of us, and, and I do want to thank my panelists, uh, co-panelists as well is that we're just coming together and putting together different thoughts and concepts. And, you know, a, a month from now, our conversations are going to be completely different, but still worrying about how do we solve some of these problems. And um, so with that, keep, keep up to date with the changing resources. And ACPA is going to have some additional offerings later. That's great. Um, some of them might be free. Some of them may not be. I don't know how they have that plan. But do pay attention to those updated resources. Go back to the IBIS world. At least that's one of one that I personally am going to be, you know, focusing in on. I'm going to be listening to that economist as well because I I have followed him for years and I think he has some relevant points to make. And um, I do want to mention one other thing on the dates. Pay attention to the date and the timeline of events, not just your evaluation date, but the timeline of events. And uh, the best one, at least, focused on what we care about, our care abouts. Um, is the one that Jim Hitchner has put out uh, following a timeline. So if you, if you have trouble getting that, um, let one of us know. We're, we'll, you know. I'm happy to share that resource. Um, Jim is happy to share it too, so you can probably find it on his website. That website is Valuation Products and Services. Valuation Products and Services. Um, as Laurie mentioned, he, Jim Hitchner does have a um, COVID timeline there that's free and available um, to download from his site. <laughs> Uh, Mark? I just want to remind everybody that you're smarter than you think. Go back to your original training with all this. This has all kind of been new, but it's kind of new, old, all over again, because we go through these on a regular basis. There's always some major event that's going to happen over your career. This is just another one. And if you go back to the fundamental analysis, you go back to what you learned and what you trained for, and if you have issues with that, work it all the way through, and again, you're not on an island. We're all here to help you. Pick up the phone and give us a call. Great. All right, Michael, you're up. So again, thank you, you everyone for joining us. Um, you hopefully answered all the poll questions. If not, um, and you communicated with our administrators through the chat, um, we'll work with you as best as we can to provide you with the CPE. Um, do visit NACBA.com COVID-19 page as Laurie and many of the panelists and, and uh, mentioned, we're still, we'll be adding more resources, more webinars, but more specifically going into this next phase, coaching and mentoring. Um, so we want to support um, the profession, all of you, um, through this, this crisis, as long as it lasts, so that you can have those confidence and resources you need uh, to, to help you and support your clients. So Michael Kaplan, a long time member of the association has developed an NACVA song. Some of you may have heard it, some of you have not. But Michael's gonna give us uh, that special rendition of his song. Michael, take it away. <laughs> Cap rates and discounts and cash flow projections, rev rules and case law and obscure code sections, hardball with Hitchner and Duffin Phelps too. Zach Myers, Greg Reagan, to name just a few. <laughs> Annual conferences, great education, member support from the organization, professional partnerships, industry stats. We value the shares for your flips and your grats. Listed proudly with your VTA and ACVA. For qualified experts in BE today, let NACFA show you the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Laurie, Mark, Greg, Zach, Hubert, and all of you for joining us. Um, stay in touch, uh, remain in touch. 
and we'll be here to support you as you need. Have a great day. Thank you guys. See you guys.